Okay folks, so this is going to be a slightly different video, similar to the access to HE video. Now the reason for this is what I want to try and do for you is to give you as much information and guidance about the university courses as possible. So what's happened is I've spoke to a few contacts and the contacts who have got back in touch are those who are pre-university or are tried university and gone a different way so what i'm going to do with this is to talk through what it means to work in the agricultural sector what it is to get a job in that industry the opportunities in the sector what type of things you can do what type of things you can't do the type of people who work in the industry and then i'll go through the agricultural degree route at a later point now I still want to touch on it because it's uh, a degree route that's very important to me and uh, I have great respect for the agricultural sector but first of all so this is episode 9 of the prospectus series but it will be a, effectively a part 1 whereas there will be a part 2 which I'll put, in, uh, put together next week for you so basically in terms of agriculture, you have various parts of agriculture. You have the arable side, you have what I would class as the livestock side, and then you have what are the emerging markets. Now, emerging markets are not technically classified in the agricultural remit currently, but they might be in the future. They are your aquaponics, hydroponics, and in some cases aeroponics they are also uh, you've got entomology and some tertiary industries like uh, apiary which is beekeeping which fall into agriculture but aren't quite in the conventional remit then you have arable farming now arable farming is your growing of crops which is very important especially regardless of if you are interested in livestock or you're not because arable farming is going to be the one that will have one of the heaviest impacts on conservation because it's crop management. Then you will ha also have it within there, you'll have your livestock management. So arable farming is split into two ways. You have the those that are growing cereals and products for human consumption. Uh, and then you have those that are grown for animal or the tertiary industries, which are like your biodiesels, which if the world goes more towards the electric car, it's which it is, it's highly likely, highly likely the biodiesel will be phased out as a result, promoting more growth of uh, products that we can actually consume at so more cereals like barley, wheat, and there will still be rapeseed, but that will be more for oils. And again, going into the food, uh, it won't be growing to the same scale. It is now, more than likely. Soya is probably the most well-known crop uh, after wheat and barley, because soya makes up a vast majority of both the vegetarian and vegan diets, as well as makes up a vast majority of animal diets. So it is a very big uh, and very important crop. It's also very easy to grow. However, it does generally grow better in hotter climates, which is why you tend to find it in countries like Brazil, uh, Peru, and the South American type countries. They're the big players in that particular industry. However, as hydroponics grows and develops, it's likely to take more of a you're going to see more different cereals growing in large warehouses at one point. So there are sustainable ways that crop management will be uh, brought into agriculture in the coming years. Now moving on to something that is more directly related to what my previous experience uh, and my previous work experiences have been, which is livestock farming. So for those of you who don't know, my livestock farming experience uh, when I was in a similar position to some of you, what some of you will be in next year or two years, uh, I started work experience on 
in zoos. I got a lot of experience around uh, field management and working with rare breeds in the zoo. From working with rare breeds, so rare breeds of cattle, sheep and some birds, I got a job offer in university working at a local dairy and free range poultry farm. So the money on dairy farms are quite good. They pay generally above minimum wage, so you get paid by, the, they have their own uh, regulating board, which sets the pay and sets the salary. The hours are tough. I used to drive an hour to get to this particular farm, and I would be there from five in the morning, and would be finishing up around half nine. Getting in at uh getting back to university for my first lectures at say ten o'clock, uh eleven o'clock. So it was a tough uh time, but the pay was very good. The uh, and you normally then went back in the afternoon. So for about uh depending on the day, half four five o'clock shift, uh finishing up at around again. Eight, half eight. If you go to certain universities, they will offer you a stockmanship opportunity. I was offered that opportunity at Harper Adams, but uh, because of working on a farm, I didn't take it up. A lot of people still did, where you go through all the general work experience related tasks. So how to shear, how to foot dip, how to work in the milking parlor, how to... Uh, into pigs and so on a variety of different skills such as ai and uh, vac uh, vaccinating all of which might be very useful for you at one point uh, and they are very useful for you to get part-time jobs over summer easter and so on those are options that you can always go with harper is always offering them if you decide to go to harper adams as a university uh, now that doesn't mean that if you were going to a university and it offers that type of opportunity that you can't go to that you can't go to those universities and study something completely different and still get that skill normally you just have to uh, sign up for a eight to ten week course and once you've signed up for that eight to ten week course do put it on your cv put it on your linkedin profile it's skills that might be useful both in the zoo industry and in the agricultural sector now the other thing that this brings me on to is you can apply the skills and knowledge that you learn from farming back into the zoo industry i picked up skills such as uh, how to drive a tractor how to drive different vehicles all of which if you're applying for farm work it shows that you're skilled in that particular uh, type of activity so I could move bales I could uh, scrape down the yard clean the yard using, using the tractor but you could also apply that to using the tractor for a zoo or using a quad bike at on the zoo those are skills that another zoo doesn't have to pay for you to learn or upskill that's something that you need to bear in mind might be a cost more cost effective way of them hiring you and it might be a something that gives you an edge over the competition uh, generally speaking uh, as well a lot of farms will accept you from a variety of different backgrounds so long as you have some practical experience and some uh, willing to work and obviously the flexibility for tough hours and tough work um, so that can be from a level two background from uh, level two Anna from the level three courses you can go straight in get a bit more experience as I've got former students who are currently in this situation and then take that experience and if you want to let a later point move into zoos that is something that you definitely can do especially if you're interested in uh, hoof stock and birds uh, because the knowledge that you can pick up from poultry and from sheep goats and cattle farming can be relevant to 
handling certain types of animals in a zoo environment. Obviously it doesn't apply to all, but will apply to some. So going into my placement year, I went into working with broiler chickens. Now, I can say this honestly from working in the sector, the broiler industry is for the most part, although it taught me a lot of skills and it gave me a lot of knowledge, it is a tough industry both from a personal point of view and you, if you ever go down this route, you'll know what I mean by it. And um, at this point now, if you want to pause this video and skip it by a minute, that way uh, you'll avoid a bit more of a graphic account. What I would say with the broiler industry is it's very hard to detach yourself from that animal when you're working in the farming uh, setting from an animal welfare background because the farming industry where you initially want to help that animal, you want to see that animal survive, whether it be pig, uh, cow or uh, chicken, I had to call out a certain amount of chickens who weren't meeting their performance grades. That is tough. It's something I had to do while I was on my placement. And it does at the time, and certainly did at the time, it does bring a tear to your eye the first time you have to do that because it's very different environment. And it, show, it shows a bit of your character, I would say, because if you, you do feel something and you do feel something for the animal and it's you know it's not there you know in the respect that that animal is due to uh, be slaughtered but it brings it more it brings it home to you to do that by your own hand and whereas with the larger animals it's using tools to do it from uh chickens you do have to do it generally speaking by hand and it's not a pleasant uh, experience but sometimes I would say doing it from a performance point of view isn't the pleasant side of it doing it however from the welfare point of view and there is a welfare point of view if the bird has broken its leg or has got itself stuck and has broken its wing and broken its back which does happen and this can happen because the animals got stuck in a particular position that it's, uh, it just happened to work, work its way into or they in some cases it can be the error of the design of the enclosure or the farm and in some respects it can be the animal just uh, ends up in that situation I've seen birds where they end up on their back and then birds have then walked over them and caused a severe amount of damage and then they've had to be dispatched that is a different kettle of fish. That is you putting the animal down because of mercy. It's quicker and less painful with a pot with poultry, especially, to euthanize it by hand than it is to use uh, other forms of euthanasia. Now, on the brighter point or on the more positive points, you learn a lot about how to spot welfare impacts on farm you learn about how to measure the animal's performance how to measure its growth how to have more of an acute understanding of how the animal is linked both from how it it gets diseases and how to prevent it getting diseases and how that links to the food chain and human supply chains now as i say my background is broiler farming although i have worked on free range as well I would, as a result of working on broiler farms, although it was an industry that taught me a lot, I will generally not buy anything from uh, broiler farms because of seeing, not just because of my own personal experiences, but more so from my experiences of uh, different schemes to improve welfare actually can have a damaging effect on the bird such as the RSPCA 
brought in a scheme to increase windows to provide natural light, but the natural light actually makes birds more aggressive, more flighty, and more likely to injure themselves, which is more distressing in a shed environment than it is if it's in a wild env- uh, or more wild environment. So if they're outside and outdoors, they have natural shade, natural shelter, and they, aren't t- they don't tend to be flighty. So they're sometimes bringing in welfare positive the air elements to the shed can actually cause more of a problem. Um, in terms of my what I learned from the company, so I learned this from Fritzenda Foods. I learned all about food safety, food hygiene, how food is managed, and how uh, the supply chain is tended to. And I and a lot of people who work in the sector, they are passionate about what they do and. It's not in their interest to cause harm to those animals. Uh, they are detached from. They don't. They are seen as numbers uh, rather than as individual animals, and that is just the difference of how the sector is. If you saw each animal as an individual, you can't really work in the sector. It's hard to detach yourself from that if you work in that. Some people. Some people manage to, and some dairy farmers and some beef farmers will have names for the bull uh, or names for particular individuals of a uh, cow. Uh, so the heifers, they will have particular names for them, but it's not generally common because it gives that attachment. And a lot of farmers tend to avoid that because of getting too attached to the animal. doesn't mean you can't value what that anim- animal is doing or what the animal is providing you with and have respect for them. So uh, it's more of a dignity in their life. So if you're going from this approach and you want to see improvements in the sector, you can work in that industry to try and steer it in the positive direction. A lot of welfare improvements can improve performance measures. If you can sell it from that point of view, a lot of the time you can sell that point to the farmer to improve. Uh, if they improve their welfare, they can actually improve their bottom line. As a result, they can generally see the merit in improving the animal's uh, quality of life. Now, if you're thinking this is something that you're interested in, whether it be poultry and learning about the poultry sector, whether it be about learning about uh, dairy and working in the milking sector or with beef suckler cows or with pigs. There are a variety of opportunities and the main difference is there is a wealth of chances for you to get into that sector because there's more demand for your skills than there is supply of people who are joining the sector. There's more Uh, farms out there that need staff then there are people who are willing to work in farms necessarily and that isn't necessarily a bad thing from your point of view you can be more competitive in some respects than agriculture students because you have a lot of the same practical skill sets but you come from a different background you're looking at different ways of improving the animal different ways of increasing the animal's performance and improving their quality of life you see it from a different side. Now that can be if you're on your level twos currently and you're thinking of what do I do next. Could be uh, after your level three, you decide you want to go into farming, and equally, some of you might decide that you want to run your own little small holding at one point, and you want to develop the skills so you can eventually set up your own business. That again is complete, uh, completely realistic that you can can do and you can start with a few sheep or a few chickens and work your way up to a larger farm uh, so long as you can source the right stock of animal and uh, raise the right crops in some respects and buy the right land then it's certainly doable and I have friends and contacts who've started uh, their own business from pretty much nothing and work their way up to having quite a decent start and a decent farm uh, and that can be done at young uh, young age. It doesn't have to be an old age uh, where you eventually get to it. So 
the other thing I want you to think about as well is as well as the skill, as well as the opportunity, as well as the job market, it's a lot of people don't realize that you're when you're working with different industries, farmers make up a lot of your stakeholders. So for those of you who are working in conservation, in some respects, you've got to understand how to manage the land because those landowners may be the person who employs you. If you're interested in conservation, they might be for you to have for the triple SIs and for this uh, rewilding projects and other areas of re uh, greenification around the country. You need your farmers on side a lot of the time. I'm not saying by any means that that should be the be all and end all and the only approach you take, but it's certainly better from working with them than working against them. And even if you don't want to pursue agriculture, you still need to know about it. You still need to know how to manage the land and how the land relates to the environment. Because let's say you're working with, uh, let's go with the honeybee and the bumblebee, which are a particular a species of animal that I have a particular interest in conserving. If the farmer does not realise that using neonicotinoids and other harmful pesticides, and this is on crops, not on livestock, uh, nothing to do with livestock, that can pot potentially decimate all the hives in the areas, and those be uh, entire bee colonies would be completely uh, completely wiped out. You've got to know how you convince that farmer to move away from harmful pesticides and chemicals. The link uh, from Grow, G R O W, uh, which grows the acronym for a company that is trying to steer people away from more intensive arable systems because there are intensive arable as there are intensive livestock management. And that video about there's a documentary going around which is still free for you to access which will teach you about land management or give you an introduction to it you need to understand that so you know how you can serve in it the species of animals are crucially important yes but you need to understand the pasture management the land management the trees the crops that border those trees the convincing the farmer to not cut down or convincing the other stakeholders, say uh, Highways England or so on, to not build a road through a woodland to uh, avoid going through someone's business but damaging a particular habitat. If you can work with those these stakeholders to promote your vision of a more greener, sustainable countryside, you will actually generally be in a more favourable position for what your end goals are. Now... If this is something that you want to do and you want to pursue more of, like I say, this is only a part one. I'm not going to go into too much detail about it here because uh, I can talk about farming for ages and ages. And I probably will do in different videos and different content that I put out for you. But this is just an introduction. And... Ne uh, the next part will be about the university options and the degrees uh, but I'll the next clip is going to be from someone who tried the university route and decided it wasn't for them but has now set up their own business and has started to diversify he's an example of someone who you could quite easily emulate now you can emulate someone but don't try to follow their exact route take some of the things and take some of their advice but then try and you've got to be the best you for the day because you won't be able to follow in their exact circumstances. Do make use of some of the advice in the clips because a lot of the schemes that you'll be promoting are such as Student Farmer or uh, Tesco's Future Farmers Foundation. These are uh, schemes that you can do as animal students. You don't need to do it as an agriculture student. You can get the experience, work in those industries for a year, get that experience and then apply it to your own CV, your own development and use it as a tool to help catapult you forward.
and that can be in a variety of different systems. I will talk about them more in later sections and later videos because it's more relevant to part two rather than this part. So hopefully you've enjoyed that. And like I say, new videos will be up next week. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Bye. At university, I had a lot of fun, uh, but at the time, uh, just certain things, some personal reasons and personal issues had got on top of me and finances as well. Unfortunately, where I came from at the time, student finance wasn't enough to even cover half the accommodation rent. So I ended up having to do a lot of work to try and keep myself just struggling along really. So that kind of put a bit more pressure on me at university. So after the first year, I decided it wasn't really going to be financially viable for myself. And I didn't feel like I would have been able to get myself that degree. So I decided then to make that jump and just get back out in the workplace and hopefully build up my CV that way to try and make sure that I could get the best possible place that I needed to after leaving university. Uh, I would say university had been a great experience for me. I made a lot of friends, a lot of good contacts, and a lot of the lecturers were very knowledgeable. But as I say, university isn't for everybody, and that's not a bad thing. You never know where you'll end up in life. You just need to have a goal and work to it. And once you've got that goal, make another one and keep working, and you'll see how far you'll get very quickly. You'll notice the improvements you'll make. Hi there, my name's Asha Gallagher. I'm the owner of Agri Contract Services. It's a, a small business that started up just over a year ago now. And uh, originally, the bit of backstory about me is I'm originally from Northern Ireland, but I came over to university at Harper Adams to learn a bit more and hopefully get a degree. After a year or so, I kind of decided it wasn't just for me. Fees and everything were getting a bit too much and didn't feel like I was getting out of it what I could. So decided then that it was the time to get back into the workplace and try and build up the CV a bit. I uh, went on then, did a few extra little jobs on dairy farms that I enjoyed doing and then decided to go a couple of harvests, a bit more experience there, a bit of bigger kit, a lot more acres to keep me busy. Then I decided I'd need to try and do something a bit more professional so I thought I'd go and put my name down and manage a dairy herd of pedigree jerseys on a 300 acre farm with about 100 jer pedigree jerseys being milked and we produced ice cream and cheese out of that milk. I did that for two years and I really enjoyed it, but I decided then that I wanted to go and do a wee bit of my own stuff and eventually then start my own business. So April 2019, I decided I'd head up and start Agri Contract Services, which was predominantly myself, hiring myself out over the short term seasons, doing lambings, harvests, doing milkings for men in the morning or so like that. Uh, more recently, I've become a bit more long-term. I've uh, I've taken on a longer-term contract now with an arable farmer where I do the majority of spraying, drilling, and with potatoes here, we have about 200 acres of potatoes, so I do a lot of the irrigation work as well when we're not too busy. And uh, I'm also helping a dairy farmer up the road. He needs his cattle fed every morning, so I go and do that before I start this job. Um, doing a wee bit myself now, I've been trying to build a business of my own a bit more than just the contract side I a lot of that for them I'll tow my own trailer and pick theirs and do standard pick up and drop off service a lot of them seem to enjoy that seems to take a lot of stress out of their day uh, at a more long-term basis now I'm looking at taking on land at the minute it's only less than 50 acres but it's still enough to get me going uh, I've been offered a couple of egg contracts while also doing a bit of rotational grazing on arable ground including the farmer that I'm currently doing a lot of my work for so it's a lot to keep me busy it's a lot to keep me motivated it's a lot to keep me pushing forward and hopefully in the next year or so I'll be able to start my own full business other than just the contract side of it and be able to have a bit more of a livestocky side while also helping out on the arable farms which will then benefit me by producing the forage and feeds and straw that I need for my own business. Hopefully by doing that, I can work with local farmers and we can all create a bit more of a stable income for each other. You know, we'll do certain agreements where I put my manure on their land and they give me straw, which is a byproduct that they don't require 100% of the time. So things like that, we're just trying to work a bit better with the environment as well, and not overload the ground on nutrients, just take what we need and what we can and farm in the best, the best way we can find possible. So hopefully in the next year or so, I'll have myself started up that way. We can see what happens then. So just remember, 
if uni doesn't work out for you there's always many other opportunities i took a while to find my feet i was a couple of maybe went home for a month trying to find jobs but as soon as the jobs list started coming through it was great i was back over in england i was doing what i enjoyed doing farming in all weathers you can see it's not the sunniest of days today but thankfully it's not pouring from the heavens so as i say you'll always find your way even if the university isn't for you but if you can give it your best attempt and see what you can get out of it but it's always at the end down to you yourself what you can do what you can put your head on to what you can put your mind to and see what you can produce you can either work for somebody as happy as larry for the rest of your life they could be looking after you very well or you can try and be a bit more risky and take the risk of actually starting your own business and seeing where you can go you may only be able to start small but give it a few years that small business will grow have a good crack at it and just remember to keep on farming thanks very much cheers now bye Over the last few years, I've been able to take part in a few agricultural programs such as the Farmers Weekly Farmers Apprentice and the Tesco Future Farmer Foundation. Uh, throughout these two programs, I was able to create new connections with people within the industry, learn from knowledgeable farmers that came in to speak with us, enjoy the challenges that were set between me and a group of friends, and also then gaining that extra group of friends with their wealth of knowledge as well we can talk away we can learn anything off each other we can bounce ideas back and forth if we have a business plan or anything like that so certain things like that i find really beneficial whenever i went on to those programs and i'm glad i got the opportunity to do so uh, again if the applications are open i would encourage anybody to actually apply for them and with any luck you could become part of it you'd be a great expert great experience that you'd enjoy and you would definitely gain a lot of knowledge, wealth, and a fair bit of fun out of it. So those are my kind of little things. Uh, if you ever want to have a chat about anything anymore, you can give me a shout if you want. I'm sure we can get the details provided to you. Uh, thanks very much. Cheers now. Bye.